Hello everyone, just wanted to wait a second to make sure that the stream had started. We are continuing our reading series of Emile Turan's A Short History of Decay. Um, I was watching last week's video and I actually noticed I pronounced his name wrong and right several times, but kind of bouncing between Turan and Turan. I don't think he'd really care, but theoretically it's Turan. Um, Forgive me if I mispronounce anything. This is obviously uh, heady work, and um, it's easy to stumble here and there. Without any further ado, let's hop right in. We'll be starting. We'll be starting with the chapter "The Anti Prophet." You'll notice it's not really written in chapters. It's written in these sort of blocks. We can see there's little sections here, little sections like that, sort of mini essays, if you will. Um, so anytime I, I read the title, that's what I'm reading. I'm reading the next section. So this is The Anti-Prophet. In every man sleeps a prophet, and when he wakes, there is a little more evil in the world. The compulsion to preach is so rooted in us that it emerges from depths unknown to the instinct for self-preservation. Each of us awaits his moment in order to propose something, anything. He has a voice. That is enough. It costs us dear to be neither deaf nor dumb. From snobs to scavengers, all expend their criminal generosity, all hand out formulas for happiness, all try to give directions. Life in common thereby, thereby becomes intolerable, and life with oneself still more so. If you fail to meddle in other people's business, you are so uneasy about your own that you convert yourself into a religion, or apostle in reverse, you deny it altogether. We are victims of the universal game. The abundance of solutions to the aspects of existence is equaled only by their futility. History, a factory of ideals, lunatic mythology, frenzy of hordes and of solitaries, refusal to look reality in the face, mortal thirst for fictions, the source of our actions resides in an unconscious propensity to regard ourselves as the center, the cause, the conclusion of time. Our reflexes and our pride transform into a planet the parcel of flesh and consciousness we are. If we had the right sense of our position in the world, if to compare were inseparable from to live, the revelation of our infinitesimal presence would crush us. But to live is to blind ourselves to our own dimension. And if all our actions, from breathing to the founding of empires or metaphysical systems, derive from an illusion as to our importance, the same is true, a fortiori, of the prophetic instinct. Who, with the exact vision of his nullity, would try to be effective and to turn himself into a savior? Nostalgia for a world without ideals, for an agony without doctrine, for an eternity without life? Paradise. But we could not exist one second without deceiving ourselves the prophet in each of us is just the seed of madness which makes us flourish in our void. The ideally lucid, hence ideally normal, man should have no recourse beyond the nothing that is in him. I can imagine him saying, Torn from the goal, from all goals, I retain of my desires and my displeasures only their formulas. Having resisted the temptation to conclude, I have overcome the mind, as I, have over, as I have overcome life itself by the horror of looking for an answer to it. The spectacle of man. What an emetic. 
love, a duel of salivas. All the feelings milk their absolute from the misery of the glands. Nobility is only in the negation of existence, in a smile that surveys annihilated landscapes. Once I had a self. Now I am no more than an object. I gorge myself on all the drugs of solitude. Those of the world were too weak to make me forget it. Having killed the prophet in me, how could I still have a place among men? The next section is titled, In the Graveyard of Definitions. Are we entitled to imagine a mind exclaiming, Everything is purposeless to me now, for I've given the definitions of all things. And if we could imagine such a mind, how locate it within duration? What surrounds us, we endure better for giving it a name and moving on. But to embrace a thing by a definition, however arbitrary, and all the more serious the are more and all the more serious the more arbitrary it is since the soul then overtakes knowledge is to reject that thing to render it insipid and superfluous to annihilate it the idle empty mind which joins the world only by the grace of sleep can practice only by extending the name of things by emptying them and substituting formulas for them. Then it maneuvers over the debris, no more sensations, nothing but memories. Under each formula lies a corpse, being and object alike die under the pretext they have occasioned. This is the mind's frivolous funereal debauch. And this mind has squandered itself in what it has named and circumscribed. Infatuated by syllables, it loathed the mystery of heavy silences and turned them light and pure. And it too has become light and pure, indeed lightened and purified of everything. The vice of defining has made it a gracious assassin and a discreet victim. This is how the stain the soul spread over the mind has been removed. The only thing which reminded it that it was alive. One of the more uh, difficult to understand sections, <laughs> in my opinion. All right, here we are. Uh, Civilization and Frivolity is the title of the next section. How could we bear the weight and sheer depth of works and masterpieces if to their texture certain impertinent and delicious minds had not added the fringes of subtle scorn and ready ironies? And how could we endure the codes, the customs, the paragraphs of the heart which inertia and propriety have superimposed upon the futile and intelligent vices if it were not for those playful beings whose refinement puts them at once at the apex and in the margin of society. We must be thankful to the civilizations which have not taken an overdose of seriousness, which have played with values and taken their pleasure in begetting and destroying them. Who knows, outside of the Greek and French civilizations, a more lucidly facetious proof of the elegant nothingness of things. The age of Alcibiades, Alcibiades and the 18th century in French in f Let me try that again. The age of Alcibiades and the 18th century in France are two sources of consolation. There's no way I pronounced that name correctly. While it is only at their final stages, at the dissolution of a whole system of behavior and belief, that the other civilizations could enjoy that lively exercise which lends a flavor of futility to life, it was in full ripeness, in full possession of their powers and of the future, that these two epochs knew the tedium heedless of everything and permeable to everything. Heedless of everything and permeable to everything. 
What better symbol than that of Madame du Dauphin, old, blind, and perspicacious? Perspicacious? Who, even while execrating life, nonetheless relished to the last its every amenity of gall. Jesus, let's read that sen let's read that sentence again. Th these couple sentences. I'm just going to read these again with proper inflection this time because they are long sentences. While it is only at their final stages, at the dissolution of a whole system of behavior and belief, that the other civilizations could enjoy that lively exercise which lends a flavor of futility to life, it was in full ripeness, in full possession of their powers and of the future, that these two epochs knew the tedium heedless of everything and permeable to everything. What better symbol than that of Madame du Dauphin? Old, blind, and pers perspicacious. Perspicacious. What better symbol than that of Madame du Dauphin? Old, blind, and perspicacious. Who, even while execrating life, nonetheless relished to the last its every amenity of gall. Good God, those are some tough sentences. Okay, moving on. No one achieves frivolity straight off. It is a privilege and an art. It is the pursuit of the superficial by those who, having discerned the impossibility of any certitude, have conceived a disgust for such things. It is the escape far from one abyss or another, which, being by nature bottomless, can lead nowhere. There remain, nonetheless, the appearances. Why not raise them to the level of a style? Thereby, we define every intelligent period. Thereby, we find more prestige and expression than in the soul which supports it, in grace than in intuition. Emotion itself becomes polite. The human being delivered to himself without any partiality for elegance is a monster. He finds only dark regions there where terror and negation imminent prowl. To know by all one's vitality that one will die, and to be unable to conceal it, is an act of barbarism. Any sincere philosophy renounces the claims of civilization, whose function consists in sifting our secrets and disguising them as recherche effects. Thus, Frivolity is the most effective antidote to the disease of being what one is. By frivolity, we abuse the world and dissimulate the impropriety of our depths. Without its artifices, how could we help blushing to have a soul? Our skin-deep solitudes, what an inferno for other people. But it is always for them and sometimes for ourselves, that we invent our appearances. We'll read one more section today. Dissolving into God. The mind, scrupulous of its distinct essence, is threatened at every turn by the things it rejects. Often abandoning attention, the greatest of its privileges, such a mind yields to the temptations it has sought to escape or becomes the prey of impure mysteries. Who has not known those fears, those dizzy spells, those deliriums which bring us back to the beast, back to the last problems? Our knees tremble but do not bend, our hands clutch without clasping each other, our eyes look up and see nothing. We preserve that vertical pride which strengthens its courage, that horror of gestures which saves us from spectacle, and the sucker of eyelids to veil an absurdly ineffable gaze. Our collapse is imminent, but not inevitable. The accident is odd, but scarcely new. Already a smile dawns on the horizon of our terrors, 
we shall not topple into prayer, for after all, he must not triumph. It is up to our irony to compromise his capital letter, up to our heart to dissolve the shudders he dispenses. If such a being really existed, if our weaknesses vanquished our resolutions and our depths, our deliberations, then why go on thinking, since our difficulties would be settled, our questions suspended, and our fears allayed, which would be too easy. Every absolute, personal or abstract, is a way of avoiding the problems, and not only the problems, but also their root, which is nothing but a panic of the senses. God, a perpendicular fall upon our fear, a salvation landing like a thunderbolt amid our investigations which no hope deceives, the immediate annihilation of our unconsoled and determinedly inconsolable pride, a sidetracking of the individual, the soul on the dole for lack of anxiety. What greater renunciation than faith? True, without it, we are committed to an infinity of dead ends. But even when we know that nothing leads anywhere, that the universe is only a byproduct of our gloom, why should we sacrifice this pleasure of tottering and splitting our skulls against heaven and earth? The solutions offered by our ancestral cowardice are the worst desertions of our duty to intellectual decency. To be fooled, to live and die duped, is certainly what men do. But there exists a dignity which keeps us from disappearing into God and which transforms all our moments into prayers we shall never offer. That's a great section. That's a great section. Next time we'll be reading, or starting off our reading with a uh, section titled Variations on Death. It's a doozy. It is a doozy, as if this whole friggin' book isn't a doozy. Um, thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed. Once again, we are reading Emile Charan's A Short History of Decay, a wonderful, beautiful, poetic text. And uh, we'll have more next week. Thanks for joining me. Have a great weekend.